Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Scrapyard. I'm your host, Nathan Mulepolder, joined here by Taylor. Hi. And Xavier. Hello. Today, we're talking about the Overwatch League, specifically the North American division of the May Melee. Before we get into that, I want to remind you, you can follow us on social media, including Twitter and Instagram, at Scrapyard Media. Of course, you can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts, especially where you're listening right now, and on YouTube with that same name, Scrapyard Media. And roll intro. You come from a land down under. So do we want to just get right into it with May Melee, guys? I mean, it was a pretty exciting time. Hey guys, so unfortunately something happened with Xavier's end of the recording and with our end of the recording that we didn't pick up the opening of his the yes, episode where he was talking about the Chinese teams during the May Melee tournament. So I just want to quickly go over some of the things that happened during the May Melee tournament with the Asian teams. So, the Chinese teams played this weekend, or during this May Melee tournament, and other than having the predictable outcome of Shanghai, which seems to be the best team in the league, winning, uh, we got some very interesting circumstances and a lot of fun things along the way. So the first was Guangzhou Charge made it just straight into the game by the, themselves. They made it. They were the top seed. So with that, it was pretty amazing because for all intents and purposes, the charge wasn't very impressive during these last couple of weeks. So it was a nice change of pace to see them actually being on top. And our second was the Hangzhou Spark versus the Seoul Dynasty, which was thrilled by the Seoul Dynasty. And as painful as it is, the Hangzhou Spark still is a pretty great team. But it was nice seeing Seoul Dynasty prove their worth and that they actually are the better, better team. However, I do have to point out that Seoul Dynasty does have this history of in tournaments being one of the better teams overall and in general. Next, which was a super fun game, was the New York Excelsior versus the Chengdu Hunters. And though the game was close, 3-2, to two, it was bound to happen that New York was going to come out on top of Chengdu because Chengdu does Chengdu things, as we've said. And so, as blessed as we were to have this, it was something that... I think we saw coming, and they were close, but not that different. And then lastly, we had the Shanghai Dragons versus the London Spitfire. And it was nice seeing London up against, like, probably the best team in the league right now. Because um, if London was in the North American circuit, we can see them going extremely far but because they are in the Shanghai, Shanghai Dragons tournament, I mean, the Asian tournament, it was more just seeing how their skills faced up against these teams who have kind of been competing against each other much longer than maybe London had been competing with them, since they've gotten a taste of kind of both sides of the tournament. And then in the semifinals, we had the Guangzhou Charge, putting up a good fight against the Shoal Dynasty, which... Again, Seoul Dynasty came out on top because they were, they're just better and the charge still look good, but I think there's some things that need to be fixed and that can be discussed in a totally different episode. And then Shanghai Dragons went against New York Excelsior, which they completely stomped the New York Excelsior. The Shanghai Dragons are incredible and I think they just came out and did things that New York wasn't expecting. And then the finals. Seoul Dynasty was up three, and then Shanghai comes in with the most inhuman reverse sweep that has ever been seen, I think, in Overwatch history. And even when they went against each other on the final tie-breaking map, 
it was like Shanghai shouldn't have won the fight, and yet they did. So I think this says a lot, and it bodes well for the Shanghai Dragons, and hopefully that we can see things go beyond this point with these teams. And I look forward to the next tournament, so please pardon us, because such so much of the audio was lost. I'm going to have to cut together some pieces, and hopefully you get the gist of the episode. Now, we will continue our episode with our discussion on the May Melee. So I think with, the, with these tournaments, I mean, one, I feel like we've been saying, and every person alive has been saying tournaments is the way to go now, because games now have stakes. They're missing the homestand hook, which made people care about random regular season games. But now that we don't have that, they're just online games, you need a hook, and these tournaments were clearly a hook. And, um, you know, a lot of people say, like, oh, tokens are the only reason people watch Overwatch League, but tokens didn't add 40,000 viewers to this week's stream. Like, the 40,000 viewers came because these games actually mattered and there were stakes involved. And I think that that's important moving forward is to make sure that these games have stakes and the tournaments uh, help that. And I, I, I think also Florida's underrated, you know, kind of everybody didn't expect Florida to be uh, run through this tournament like they did. And I think that Florida's dominance through this tournament helped bring in more viewers because now it's like, holy shit, can Florida beat the San Francisco Shock? And it's this really great narrative that will keep people watching. And the next, you know, the June Jamboree or whatever they're going to call it is going to be uh, <laughs> is going to be super exciting as well um, because of this tournament format. And so, like, as we said, you know, Call of Duty League is knocking out the tournament thing. I think that Overwatch is doing a smart job uh, adopting the tournament style. And the North American bracket was fun. I mean, there are a lot of interesting storylines. Yeah, I mean, we only had two teams that had to qualify, so that's fun. And they were both from Canada, so that was one thing. Uh, but I think because of the whole situation that happened with the Titans, because it's Toronto Defiant versus Vancouver Titans, I think of the whole switching teams and moving around pieces that happened with the Vancouver Titans is what kind of caused them to not be as prepared for this tournament. And I'm hoping that when it comes down to the June Jamboree, as we're calling it right now, that we have like a Titans that is more polished and has worked together and has gotten um, some time getting used to how it's done. And that we can actually see them going further, especially for a team that was like, the best of the best last year. But it doesn't surprise me that Toronto did get the chance to, like, beat them because they did, you know... It was a close game. Not saying it wasn't, but... It's just Vancouver hasn't had as much time to prepare. And, you know, there there were some circumstances surrounding this game. I mean, it was a five-map series. a uh, Very close game. But I, th there are obviously circumstances surrounding this game that I think prevented Toronto from just destroying them. And I think that Agilities was sick and sure for uh, apparently was feeling burned out. And so they kind of let him sit out uh, that weekend. And so obviously Toronto was missing the, their two most, uh, yeah, like, yeah, like two of some of their most important players and uh, clearly their best echo in, in Agilities was, was missing. And so Toronto was playing, with a brand new player, I think his name was Zick. Uh, they were playing with a brand new player, and you know, Logics was in there, but you know, Logics hasn't really ever been a full time starter for this Toronto team, and so Toronto definitely struggled more than I feel like they should have. But I do think that if Agilities and Surefor were playing this game, that it might have been a three one or even a three zero, um, just because just because Agilities is a lot better and Sure4 is definitely a lot better. And so missing those two was, was kind of crucial. But when you look at, you know, to, uh, the Titans and their, and their performances game, I think that the Titans, I've been saying this for a while that give it a month and the Titans are going to be like, all right. Like I think in the June Jamboree, they're going to be 
an actual competent Overwatch team. I mean, you look at this now and, and bringing in Shockwave instead of, um, what was the, the other homie? Bring in Shockwave instead of the other homie. Uh, Suna, Suna. Yeah, it's Suna. Uh, bringing in Shockwave in, over, over at Suna was a huge deal because Suna isn't really a projectile dude like that. And Shockwave played Hitscan a, a lot, but he looked incredible on Echo and he it was basically his team. Like it was the Vancouver shockwaves for, for a little bit. Um, and I think that having him on the team is going to somewhat take the pressure off Dalton of having to try super hard to win. And then it's going to allow him to kind of frag out a little more in the June tournament. And the rest of their team is just figuring things out. Like their tank line looked better. Uh, what was the name? Car car. Like he's not, complete ass now like this team is figuring stuff out and like i said they're a team that was formed like two weeks ago yeah that's what i was saying when they like they weren't prepared to go into this tournament but as you said give it a month and they'll be completely a totally different team and will probably really look a lot cleaner a lot more solid because this is like only the second game this team has ever played and they're still working things out it's just like after the huge break where uh, Shock came back and they lost to both LA teams. And then everybody was like, they're not going to be good. And then literally a week later, they bounced back. It's just giving the time to get back into the competitive uh, headspace instead of just, we've been scrimming all this time. Let's, you know, oh shit, now we're in the game. You know, it's just getting back into that mental awareness of the difference well i guess one more thing on on uh the titans like we need to keep in mind that like they were like playing in contenders and then they suddenly had to jump into overwatch league and there isn't a single player that you can talk to that is like oh yeah like contenders in overwatch league like same skill level you know and like when i talked to poco And, you know, we talked about, like, kind of, like, the skill level of the Overwatch League as the league has matured. The skill level has gotten significantly higher. And and for a dude like even FD God, when he started playing at a higher level, like, he had to make an adjustment. And I think with all players, like, you can't just expect these dudes to come from contenders and, like, immediately pop off no matter how good they are. Because they need to adjust to the speed of the game and how things are working out. And, yeah, Toronto isn't, like, great, but... Uh, even going 3-2 against Toronto is a worthwhile uh, accomplishment, I think. Like, it, like it, yeah, like it's worth something. Yeah, and then moving on to the knockouts, which are teams that didn't have, didn't have to qualify, but they're trying to like go up against Shock, LA, Valiant, Philadelphia Fusion, and like Florida Mayhem. So we had Paris Eternal versus Boston, which is a lot closer than I thought it would go especially given Boston's track record so far. But a lot of the... Dude, Boston's kind of good now. Like, Boston's all right now. Yeah. But a lot of the rest of the ones, like Atlanta versus Toronto, Los Angeles Gladiators versus Justice, Dallas Field versus Houston Outlaws, these were all kind of things where I could see the score being reflected as correct. Because these are all those middle ground kind of teams. And so... It doesn't surprise me that, you know, Toronto, Washington, and Houston, who kind of fall behind, still fall behind when it comes into this tournament standings, and Boston rising above where we thought they would probably do. Especially against a team like Paris, which is like Philadelphia's biggest rival right now. So, I think that was really good. Yeah, Boston Boston had a really good performance for themselves, and honestly... I didn't think they were going to win that map five. Um, I don't know, like Paris, like I don't think Boston is ready for like those super clutch moments. Like, like it's kind of the same thing with Paris when they, when they played Philly super close after that first game, like Philly just kind of figures out that map five and, and wins it. And, you know, Paris isn't ready to win a close map five against an elite team like Philly yet, you know, uh, do it consistently, obviously. And I think Boston is not, 
ready yet to win a close map five against a good team like Paris. But Boston is getting better and they are getting good enough to push these teams to a map five. And I think that the shining star of this team is not just Jerry, but I think that people are really starting to, to see Myung Bung as their best uh, player and viewing him as one of the top rookies and one of the best Anna's bar none. And that alongside with color hex actually having a really strong weekend made for Boston to look like really good. And I think that Boston is another team that's looking to make like an actual like tear jump. And I think that Boston is going to be able to kind of match up with like the Atlanta's and the gladiators, which they beat, but like, you know, best of five series, they're not beating the gladiators three out of, you know, three out of five times. But I think that Boston is looking to make that like next tier jump up to kind of be matched up with those gladiators type teams. And I think that they're totally capable of it. They're, they're figuring things out and I like what I'm seeing. And I think that like the rest of this, like knockout round was like, I mean, like, yeah, the gladiators are going to beat all Washington, like cool. Uh, Washington isn't good. Uh, Janu can be as good as he wants. You can't one V six as a off tank. It just be like that. Um, <laughs> it's not going to happen. And Atlanta, Toronto is not good enough to beat Atlanta, obviously. And then the fuel. Yeah. Again, like I said, these are all just like the mid tier teams. So Toronto, Washington and Houston kind of always fall behind these teams anyway. So they just matched up with teams that are just too good for their skill level at this point in the league, I would say. Yeah, and Houston ran into Decay while he was playing, like, the best game of his life. Like, Decay was... Decay was just dunking on everybody in that Houston game. And I just... I, I think that Houston, they played him close their last game. But Decay like leveled up or something over the week and basically won that game by himself. So the knockouts were kind of boring, just in the sense that all the games were kind of expected results and nothing really uh, stood out. There weren't really any upsets and there weren't really any like, oh, wow, this team is like actually low key popping off other than the Boston game. So it was like three out of the four games were, were very predictable. Uh, but then we went in quarters, and the teams got to pick their opponents. So the Shock picked Dallas, and then Florida picked Atlanta. Uh, Philly picked the Gladiators, and L.A. were left with uh, having to play Paris. So that Shock-Dallas game, I think, is actually really interesting. Uh, just because, I don't know, like, when they picked Dallas, like, motherfuckers were like, oh, wow, you really want to go against Decay? And the shock just completely shut that shit down. Well, I it's it's funny because I always San Francisco knows who they're good against. So no matter what, it's like they picked Dallas because out of all the options, it's the easiest matchup. And if they got first pick, then obviously they're gonna take the easiest and hope that Atlanta stomps Florida, Philly stomps the Gladiators, and. Whoever gets ahead in the Valiant game gets ahead in the Valiant game, and that they would have an easier time. I th I feel like that was like the mentality, but the Dallas and San Francisco shot game was a lot of fun because it's uh, when we'll get to this later when we talk about the finals. It's something where I'm like the mentality of like how fans think of teams is really funny to me, and so. You know, as as we move on, just kind of through the bracket, uh, yet again, a lot of performances that happen. I think Philly, uh, you know, we've been talking bad shit about the uh, the Gladiators for a while. But the Gladiators did the Gladiators thing of falling short again, uh, and they lose to Philadelphia, which, which was a natural uh, occurrence. Um, it was going to happen. And, and I think the Gladiators are still overrated by a lot of people. Uh, so hopefully this kind of sets what's going to happen. Um, and then Florida beating Atlanta was actually really surprising to me. I, I thought Atlanta was going to end up winning this game. And 
even though like I'm not like a big fan of Atlanta. Yeah, that was extremely surprising. I mean, it's Florida. Yeah, like Florida's been doing good, but I, you know, I was like, well, Florida fucking beat up on like Boston and Vancouver. Like Florida was playing like fake Overwatch teams, and so like they were winning impressively, but I didn't really put a lot of stock into those wins. And I feel like an idiot for not doing that because they went in there and completely outclassed Atlanta. And even though I don't think Atlanta was ever going to be a top tier team um, and they are just a mid tier team, I thought they were mid tier enough to like beat Florida and then move on to lose to Philly. And so that was a very interesting game to me. And I think that after this game, it felt like, oh shit, they might like run through this tournament because it wasn't just that they beat Atlanta. It, when I went to rewatch it, it was how unfair the game felt. It felt like Atlanta was a team that was supposed to be in like knockout rounds and they just kind of made it there. So that was an interesting game to me. And I think that this was the beginning of a weekend of BQB wanting people to put some respect on his name. And I appreciate that because BQB was. BQB had, like, some of the crazy... Like, I can pull them up uh, if you kind of want to go over some of the... Like, you know, some of your thoughts on these quarterfinal games. But BQB had kind of an incredible tournament, uh, all things considered, throughout this main melee. So I I guess I'll just kind of bring up these BQB stats right now. Um, He was... Like, I don't think anyone, any one of us, or anyone who's really talking about BQB is, like, a god. Uh, but if you kind of look at just some of the stats throughout this entire uh, main melee, uh, BQB had 159 final blows, and Yaki had 157, but they Yaki and BQB were number two and three in terms of final blows. Um, Yaki led, led the league with a 2.2. Yaki and BQB both had a 2.2 uh, final blow to death ratio. Uh, BQB Yet BQB and Yaki, yet again, number two and three, uh, 149 and 148. And then the fourth place was 322, or 349 and 348. And then the next closest was Void at 322 for eliminations. So Yaki and BQB and Fleta were the top DPS this weekend. And BQB led in hero damage. He led by more than 20,000 uh, uh, points of hero damage. And kind of looking at this like i don't remember bqb ever being like a top tier elite level kind of dps like that you know you know i always thought of him like as as a fine player but i definitely always thought of sia player as being better than him but i think that he leveled up this weekend and this doesn't feel just like a um One of those, oh, he had a really good weekend and now he's going to be like back to average. I feel like this is going to be the start of a trend of him playing with more confidence and him kind of letting people know who the fuck he is. Yeah, thinking about the semifinals in general, San Francisco versus Valiant, which is something we kind of expect. And again, it's because with the the shock and the balance it's gone back and forth for forever and i think at this point because there's such a, a an actual rivalry that started all the way in the first season of the league that these games are still fun to watch even though we know the valiant isn't as as high of level as the shock but they're still clearly from the like this tournament have something going for them and then when it came down to Florida beating Philly, I think that's the that was the actual moment where everybody actually was like, oh, oh, okay, let's let's watch this um this the finals, which was probably the best game of Overwatch this season yet. Like this had levels of shock versus Vancouver for the like second time. Where everything just kind of came down to, well, this time it wasn't Blizzard World, but it's the same, like, it had that same feeling where it was like, this could go neck and neck 
all the way up until the end. Because even at the end, I was like, Florida might actually pull it off and get it back to a tie. But then shock woke up, basically. But it was such an amazing set of games. And I'm, glad, so. and I'm glad that we got to have this because after Xavier gives his opinion, it's just, it's it says something about all these teams in general when they face up against, like, the shock. See, I think the thing that's interesting is, I mean, like, the Valiant are, we're never going to beat the shock. Like, the Valiant are a good team, but they're worse than the shock. And, and so they just have a ways to go. Like, it, it's fine. Like, you're okay. Uh, Valiant tried really hard. And they're overperforming, which is great. But I don't, like, nobody could have, like, expected the fucking, like, Florida Mayhem to beat Philadelphia like they beat Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia looked, looked not ready for the game. And it looked like they just completely gave initiative to the mayhem to do whatever they wanted. And the mayhem were just able to play what they wanted when they wanted and play as aggressive as they wanted. Like they dictated the pace of the game and Florida just felt like they were constantly reacting. And and it's a shame because like alarm had a really good game, but it didn't matter Um, because the team as a whole, just wasn't able to compete with Florida because they were constantly reacting. At least that's kind of what it felt like. They were constantly reacting to what Florida was doing. And that's not how you win Overwatch. You you have to you have to be the aggressor. You have to take initiative. You have to always be in control. Um, and fucking Philly wasn't. So but but an interesting thing, I guess before I talk about like the finals, but I feel like like one, Florida's not better than Philly like in a holistic sense yet. I think Philly, I think Florida needs like one more good week or two to really make me think like, oh shit, Philly has arrived because we've seen this where a team has a really good tournament and then the next tournament, they're just like back to like whatever. Um, And so I think Florida needs to kind of prove a little more because Philadelphia has been doing it all season and they've been shitting on people all season and they just need to prove it a little more. But like, Florida's right below Philly and they're breathing down their necks. But I think just another interesting thing to kind of think about is I don't believe like, you know, because Florida destroyed Philly, I think people have it in their mind that the shock would have completely destroyed Philly. But I do think that it's a whole different style and, and it's whole different teams. And I think that, yeah, like Florida beat Philly and that's just kind of like, shit happens but i think if philly did end up winning they wouldn't have got completely destroyed by the shock either i think it still would have been a close game uh maybe four three maybe still it would have been a four two but philly would have made a respectable showing of themselves and i think that just the style that whatever you know whatever an analyst might think but like the style that florida played just destroyed philly but i think that in a game against the shock it might be have been different. So I don't necessarily think that Florida winning is a definitive statement on whether or not Philly is a sham team or not. Yeah. I think Philly put all their eggs into, well, we're going to be, we're going to go up against a shock. So they played reserve against Florida. And when you play reserved against a team where they have the possibility of doing a shocking thing, then your passiveness falls to their like, assertiveness so i feel like philly was just like oh well we're gonna go up against shock at the end in the end because they're gonna completely defeat them and then they undermined florida's actual power which i think is something that and i was telling you about this how close the game between florida and the shock were and how everybody was starting to go like oh maybe the shock isn't as good because florida is a bad team and it's like you Nobody leaves these teams room to, like, grow. It's just either you're a really good team and you have to stay good, and if you start losing to a bad team, you've immediately gone bad. Or, like, none no, none of the teams can, like, be considered, like, a growing thing. And I think that comes from not just, like, fans thinking it, but I think it's how sometimes 
the casters present the teams. Where it's like if Washington Justin Justice did this exact same thing, everybody would have been like, "Oh my, oh my God, these teams are so bad now because Washington is a quote unquote bad team." Where it's like they're still professionals, they're just things aren't working within the organization, and if they got those things figured out, then this team would have gone somewhere. It's the same concept with Florida. They finally have it figured out. It took them three seasons, but they finally got it figured out. And now they're actually working on making these players good and putting out effort and making them compete harder. And I think that a lot of the time, teams, people just look at Florida Mayhem went into the finals of this quarter against Shock and almost won. And they're like, well, that just means that the best team in the league is doing worse than it's undermining how much work these players and the coaches and the organization is putting in to get to this point. Because, like, you were sharing me the tweets of what everybody was saying behind the scenes, and it's like, they want it. They're working for it. You shouldn't undermine these players just because, in the history, this organization had a bad time, because Shanghai is now the best team in... It's a whole different organization now. Yeah, it's Shanghai is the best team in the league, and that all sprouted from them being the worst team in the league, but now you can... But everybody thinks of it totally different. And... I just don't think you should undermine these players when the organization has grown as a whole to get to this point. Yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of growth for Florida. And and with that final, I think that Florida like wrote that shit as long as they could throughout the tournament, and they just ran into the world champions. Like I don't think Florida should ever be like Losing to, like, and, and their coach said the same thing. Like, shit, we made it. No, no, we didn't think we'd make it this far, and we made it this far. So congratulations to my dudes in Florida. And, and that makes complete sense because Florida wasn't supposed to make it to the finals, and Florida isn't supposed to beat the world champions yet. And so, but what what I think, like, really bodes well for Florida, I almost feel bad that, like, we're not even talking about the shock, but, like, who the fuck cares? The shock won. Who cares? Like, they're really good. Wow, shocking. But with Florida, I think what really shows well for them is they didn't win, like, they didn't go out weak. You know, they they went out playing hard, and they gave the shock, like, some shit to think about. Like, like that, I think it was Blizzard World. Yeah, that Blizzard World, where they completely full held and destroyed the shock. Like that's that's meaningful, and that's something that a good team can only do. You're not gonna see fucking like Washington do that to them. You're you're not like you need to be a good team to full hold the shock, and so I think that alongside with just like standing up to them and and fighting them at their pace means a lot uh, for Florida in the future, and I think it's a really good experience for them because they've never had to play in one such a high stakes match ever and two against one of the best fucking overwatch teams ever in in the san francisco shock it was their first final ever yeah in the history of the organization it was their first final ever and so you shouldn't win that yeah like sometimes shit gets like really hard and you're not built for those situations. And you look at the shock and I think one of the things that I really enjoy about watching the shock is how patient they are and how they set little traps and don't fucking like jump at the first opportunity to do something. And that's just a sign of a veteran team. I think that um, on Nepal was, was a perfect example of that where that first point of Nepal, I think it was on, I'm pretty sure it's called shrine, but the shock like nobody capped the point for like almost like two minutes within the game. And it was because the shock were just playing super careful and, and using that em- using the empty space of the neutral to kind of push and pull and, and find their right spot. And then once they finally found the right spot, then they ended up capping. But the level of patience that they exhibited on Nepal is something that only a veteran team can do. And that's something that Florida doesn't have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, th- the thing that stood out to me during that very, like, the, the Nepal map was 
how they had locked them all into that overview, like the little where the big health pack is on that bridge area between the shrine and where, you know, Roadhog will pull you into your dis demise, um, where they trapped them with the Molten Core ult, and they couldn't get out, and that was just literally ticking away at them capturing, them getting percentage on the point, which is something that I think I've never seen the shock do on, like, a control map like that, where they just kind of capture the point and then do everything they can to, like, not allow, defensively not allow anybody onto the point. And I don't think I've ever seen that done by the shock or by a lot of other teams. And I think that also doesn't bode well for Florida because they were approaching it as such a weird way. But I also think that's because the Torbjorn turret was like over there. So they were trying to get rid of that. But it was just the, the concept of actually seeing these teams like for once do something that was totally different than how I'm used to seeing them play. And I have to, I have to give it to Florida because they legitimately came out and then the uh literally after this game i was playing uh overwatch and i ended up on a team of the florida mayhem fan so i'm in my shock skin and they're in their florida mayhem skin so it was a lot of it was a lot of fun because it was something that we could talk about while playing through the game and how see i would have been toxic you would have been toxic that's why you've uh, almost been banned from blizzard <laughs> listen man like some people be dropping the hard R and like you gotta let them know that that's not okay. Uh and and We should have won that gunfight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Me and Nathan played gunfight last night and uh homies dropped the hard R after after we killed him. And and uh needless to say, I, I choked. <laughs> and we didn't win. Uh look man, they won off a of capture, it don't count. Yeah, it don't count. Yeah, that was kind of weak, but no, I totally agree. I think the main melee was very good. And the shock were mature. Like, they were setting traps, like, they were setting traps for the Valiant and the Mayhem that was, like, some shit you just don't see. And, and I think that, I don't know, like, I think that their, their evolution right now is they are vets they are smart they are so well coached and if you're a young team you can't just chase like i think it was on king's row i forget which team they played but like they fucking just baited them into like a huge i believe it was a fire strike and it's the thing where it's like they dangled that carrot and they knew i think it was la but they like knew la was gonna go for that carrot and snatch them and that i think that's the sign that's the sign that you're an excellent team. When, when you start, like, setting traps and shit, like, that's when you know you're elite. And, and I think they're playing the highest level Overwatch we've ever seen. I think they did things similar to maybe Season 1 New York, where they would just kind of put Jonak right there in front for a Sombra, let's say, back when Sombra was a thing. And they just would put Jonak right there in, in, in the viewpoint of the team... But Jonak always was like protected by the diva, and you could uh, you would see that they would catch the Sombra. Jonak would be able to pop his ult, and then there was just those baiting moments where New York does it very rapidly, and of course using Jess kind of like Jonak. But we saw with the shock that they could literally. There's so many people on that team that it's like this is the best guy on the team. Put a target on him that. They know. It's like, oh, Super's in. Of course they're going to target him. Oh, Rascal's in. Of course they're going to target him. Like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Violet's in. Anybody. Whoever. And then it gives p people who are new, like, Ons the opportunity to just absolutely destroy people. And I think that's what the shock has finally gotten to, especially when it comes down to this kind of tournament system. And before we finish this episode, I saw on YouTube Rhineforce's like power ranking or the league's power ranking. I'm not entirely sure how it was, but it has Shock Florida. No, it's it's Rhineforce. 
Yeah, Shock, Florida, and then I don't remember who else. But, and this is, like, kind of known by now, if you've followed us for a long time, that, like, me and Xavier have very hard opinions against any of the casters and any of the statistics people on the league, because... Well, all right, all right, wait, wait, wait. I, I gotta come to defense on, on the homie. But no, 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 I'm not saying that it's not, like, bad. Oh, If you're taking it just based off this weekend, that's, like, a great, like, that's a great ranking system. But I'm saying, for the most part, we disagree. But I think this one time, I'm like, if you're just judging it off of what we saw this weekend after, you know, totally changing up how we're playing the game, kind of, instead of doing, like, the weekly just play, 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 if you're changing it up to this, I think this was the perfect time to drop this kind of, like, here's the new set of power rankings based on solely this melee. Here's the thing. One, power rankings are fucking stupid. Well, yeah. Um, no, no, like, like seriously, like, like we need, to, we as a community need to understand that power rankings are stupid. All right, like, that's it. That's it. We just need to understand. They should be left in anime. No, yeah, we just need to understand that, like, for one, power rankings are stupid, and, like, they're fun for, like, discourse, and, like, talking about things, it's like, oh, like, this is, this is neat, or whatever, but I feel like people have it in their brain that power rankings, one, are, like, objective, and if somebody has, like, a power ranking, like, oh, wow, this is ridiculous, like, it's like every opinion, political or, or, or social or whatever. Like, if you have an opinion and you can back it up, then fucking it's, it's a fine opinion. And, and you just, you're contingent on the quality of your arguments. But I think the biggest thing that we kind of need to kind of to, to hit up on is the different philosophies behind like power rankings is I feel like a lot of people are disconnected on what exactly power ranking are. Some people have it in their head that like a power ranking is the teams at the top should always beat the teams below them. And it's a ranking of the best teams in the league, but some, and I think Ryan Forrest does this. He, his power rankings are more in the sense that like, like are more in the sense Sorry, I got a random uh, text saying, Xavier, online Fortnite solos, $600 prize. Like, I'm not clicking on that link. I don't want a virus. But, <laughs> but like, all right, so some people have it as, like, the top teams always beat the bottom teams. Like, this is a hard ranking of who is the best. But I think Ryan Force does it in the way that I, I think, like, a lot of people do their power rankings and should do it, where it's, like like, a stock market, like, you know, a team wins that week, they go up. A team loses, they go down. And depending on how bad they lose or how good they win, they move up and down higher or lower. And I just think some people, just their fucking brains break when they see a power ranking that's like, wow, you still have Philly as number two or like number three, but they're still above Flor Florida who beat them. And it's like, shut the fuck up, dude. But... I don't know, like, it's just, like, a weird thing of power rankings where I just think a lot of people put too much stock in them when they are, I feel like power rankings are just exclusively to, like, get people to talk, and nobody passes their power rankings off as objective. But I think that's just, like, a weird internet thing that people, you know, fucking put too much stock in, like, random analyst power rankings. Uh, but Ryan Force is cool. Sometimes he, like, says a lot and doesn't say anything, but, like, I do the same thing, so... Fucking... We're homies, I guess. <laughs> Sometimes that's the entirety of this channel's content, is just saying a lot without saying anything. That's the entirety of sports content, like, as a whole. Like... Fucking one sec, one sec. We're... Alright. I'm going to ESPN.com. And... I want to see how much shit doesn't matter. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for this special May Melee episode of The Scrapyard. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media at Twitter and Instagram at Scrapyard Media. Find us anywhere you listen to podcasts, especially where you're listening right now. The world could always use more heroes. Roll outro. Better run, better